Today we're going to begin to discuss Newton's laws of motion. In this PowerPoint we'll talk about Newton's first law and we'll also review the concepts of mass and weight and we'll also talk about volume and density. The first thing that we have to do before we can discuss Newton's laws we have to discuss what we mean by a force. A force is a push or a pull. So if you push on an object or pull on an object you're exerting a force on that object. And one of the things that you'll recognize right away about a force is that there are two things that are important when you exert a force on an object. One is how hard you push or pull, but the other is what direction you push or pull the object in. And therefore, force is known as a vector. And a vector simply is a quantity that has both a magnitude and a direction. So when we specify a force, we really have to not only say how big the force is, but we have to say in what direction the force acts. Uh, as, exa as an example of that, I might say if I have an object that I'm exerting a force of four newtons, and it turns out the Newton is the unit that we use for force, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And here, therefore, I have a force of four Newtons acting to the right. That would be the force. The next thing we need to talk about is what we mean by the net force acting on an object. The net force simply is the sum of all the forces acting. But we have to be a little bit careful here because force is a vector, so it's not only how big the force is, but in what direction the force is acting that's important. So let's say I have a force of four newtons to the right acting on this object, but let's say there's also a force of three newtons to the left. What do you think the net force would be on that object? Well, the answer is that the net force would be one newton to the right. Because that force of three newtons to the left essentially cancels out three of the four newtons acting to the right. So in other words, we just subtract the forces. So if forces are acting in the same direction, they add. If forces are acting in opposite directions, then they subtract. All right. We're now ready to look at Newton's first law, which is called the law of inertia. And Newton's first law says a body will remain at rest or will continue to move with constant velocity in a straight line unless acted on by a net force. So if the net force is zero, the object stays at rest or keeps moving with a constant velocity in a straight line. So let's think a little bit about what that means. So if, it, if it's at rest, it will stay at rest. So if I've got an object that's just sitting here on the table, if it's staying at rest, that means the net force has to equal zero, because that's what Newton's first law says, that an object will stay at rest as long as there's no net force. So if an object is just sitting there on the table, all of the forces that are acting on it have to add up to zero. And that's kind of, that one maybe is fairly straightforward to understand. The one that people have a little bit more trouble with is this one. Once an object is moving, no force is required to keep it moving, right? Because an object in, will move with constant velocity as long as there's no net force. So what that's saying is, the object will just keep moving. Now, we don't see this so much in everyday lives because if I push an object, like I you know, take my pencil and push it along the table, that object will stop. But the reason it stops is because there is a force acting on it, which is the force of friction. A good way to uh, see what would happen if there were no forces present is think of a hockey puck. So if I've got a hockey puck on ice and I give it some initial velocity, that puck will go for a long time before it stops. And the reason for that is because 
there's almost no friction. So we almost have that situation of no net force acting on the object, and therefore it will just keep moving. We call this property of matter um, inertia, this property that every object has that makes it want to resist changes in its state of motion. So an object that's already moving wants to keep moving. An object that's already at rest wants to stay at rest. So that property is called inertia. Let's talk about what we mean by weight. Um, weight, as we mentioned way back at the beginning of the course, is simply the force of gravity. So the force that the Earth exerts on an object, that's what we mean by weight. Let's now ask this question. What's the net force acting on you right now? So let's just imagine that you're standing. And we can see that if you're standing, you're at rest. So if you're at rest, the net force acting on you has to be zero because an object will only stay at rest if the net force is zero. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't forces acting on you. In fact, if you're standing there, there are a couple forces acting. Um, one force that's acting on you is the force of gravity. So gravity is acting down on you. But what other force is acting on you? Well, the other force is the force that the floor exerts. Because if the floor weren't there, you'd be falling. And it just so happens that the force the floor exerts up and the force of gravity down exactly cancel each other out. So even though there are two forces acting, the net force on you is zero. Let's take a look at another example that illustrates Newton's first law. Remember that an object will continue moving unless there is a net force on the object. So here we have a car with a person in it, and this person is not wearing a seat belt. So what do you think is going to happen when the car hits that red barrier right there? Well, let's see what happens. Whoa, <laughs> you'll notice what happened. The car got stopped by that barricade, but because the person wasn't wearing their seatbelt, there was nothing to exert a force on them, and so they just had to keep going. And that's why we wear seatbelts, because otherwise, an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a net force. So if you don't have a seatbelt on and you hit a solid object like that, you're going to go right out through the windshield. Let's look at a problem that we will just illustrate this concept of um, the, the net force on an object having to be zero if the object is at rest. So the question says, how much force must each rope exert? We have a person on a pla painting platform. The person weighs 200 pounds and the platform weighs 100 pounds. By the way, the pound is another unit of force. And that's a unit of force in the British system. And the pound and the newton are related to each other. Here's the conversion factor. One pound is equal to 4.5 newtons. All right, so let's see how we would figure out this problem. What we know is that the force on this object, on the platform, would have to be zero. The net force would have to be zero if that platform is staying at rest. So if you think about the forces acting on the platform, we have the force down of the person, which is 200 pounds. And we also have a downward force of the platform itself, which is 100 pounds. 
So therefore, the total force down is 300 pounds. So in order for this to stay at rest, the total upward force also has to be 300 pounds. And assuming that that's split equally between the two ropes, then each rope exerts 150 pounds. Okay, so that's an example of a problem that illustrates Newton's first law. Let's take a look at this problem. Uh, a car is driving down the highway with a constant velocity. What is the net force acting on the car and how many forces are acting on the car? So this is one that often tricks students. So you're driving down the highway with a constant velocity. So if you're moving with a constant velocity, what has to be true about the net force? Newton's first law says the only way you can travel with a constant velocity is if the net force is zero. Okay, so that has to be true. Now, just because the net force is zero doesn't mean there are no, no forces acting. Let me just draw a car here. So, just in case you can't tell, that car is moving in that direction. So here's a car. Let's look at what forces are acting. Well, one force acting on the car is just the force of gravity. Another force that's acting up is the force that the road exerts up. Because if it weren't for that, the car would be falling into the ground. We've got two more forces that are acting. One is the force that your engine provides to make the car go forward. And then the force that is keeping your car from going effortlessly is the force of friction. So in other words, you know what would happen if you're traveling on the highway and you lay off the uh, gas pedal, your car would start to slow down. The only reason it's slowing down is because there's friction. If there were no friction, then your car would continue at, with a constant velocity. So when your car is driving down the highway at a constant velocity, that simply means that the only thing your engine is doing is exerting a force to exactly counter the force of friction so that there is no net force on your car. And if there were, then you wouldn't be going with a constant velocity. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about mass and weight. Um, imagine that you have a small mass. So think about like picking up a coin and shaking it back and forth in your hand. And think about how hard that would be. And then think about picking up something really heavy like a, like a dumbbell and try shaking that back and forth. Which is going to be easier to shake? Well, obviously, the smaller the mass, the easier it is to shake. And that's because mass is a measure of inertia. So an object that has a larger mass has more inertia, um, and an object that has less mass has less inertia. And I could get you to think about that in a different way if I said, I'm, I want to either throw a plastic ball at you, or I want to throw a baseball at you. Um, which one would you rather try to stop? Well, everybody's going to say, I'd rather stop the plastic ball because it has less mass. It's easier to stop it than it is to stop something that has more mass. So remember that mass is simply a measure of the amount of matter in an object. It's just determined by how many atoms and the type of atoms that make up the object. Also, remember that mass is measured in either kilograms or grams. The official SI unit for mass is kilograms.
We've talked about what weight is before. Remember that weight is just the gravitational force on an object and force is measured in newtons. So it's really important to have the difference between mass and weight um, clear in your head. Mass is just a measure of the amount of stuff in an object. The mass of an object doesn't change if you bring it from here to the moon. Whereas the weight of an object, that's the force of gravity, so that does change. Let's talk about volume. Sometimes people get volume and mass confused. Volume is the amount of space that an object occupies. Remember, mass is the amount of matter, the amount of, essentially, the amount of atoms in the material. So volume is the amount of space that an object occupies. And uh, volume is generally measured in units such as liters or centimeters cubed, meters cubed. All of those would be valid uh, units for volume. Let's talk about density. Density is the mass per volume of an object. So density is measured in units of mass over units of volume. So usually either kilograms per meter cubed or grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, so density is mass per volume. Let's talk about how to calculate the weight of an object. Mass and weight are related to each other because we know that if we pick up something that doesn't have very much mass, it doesn't feel very heavy. It doesn't have a very big force of gravity on it. If we pick up something that has a lot of mass, it also feels heavy to us. So it has a larger weight or a larger force of gravity. The relationship between weight and mass is the following. You can calculate the weight of an object by taking the mass of the object and multiplying by 9.8 meters per second squared. That's called the acceleration due to gravity. And the acceleration due to gravity is simply the, the, um, how fast an object will fall or what the acceleration of an object will be if you drop it. And uh, we talked a little bit about acceleration uh, in the previous PowerPoint. And so that's the acceleration of an object if you drop it. So let's do a quick example. How much does a three kilogram object weigh? Well, in order to figure this out, the weight of the object is just equal to the mass of the object times g. And therefore, I want to take three kilograms and multiply by 9.8 meters per second squared. If you do the math, what you come out with is 29.4 newtons. Now, you might wonder, where did I get newton there? Because it looks like my units should be kilograms times meters per second squared. That, in fact, is the definition of a newton. So that's what a newton is, okay? so. Just remember that if you have the mass in kilograms and you multiply by 9.8 meters per second squared, that will give you the weight in newtons.